all that you all have done all week. Um, each day, one of our devotionals, uh, the morning devotional, one of those is led by one of the campers. The girls have been meeting in the lodge and the young men have been meeting down here and it was uh, divvied up and by uh, volunteer that we asked for people to do those devotionals and our young people were the ones who stepped up and, and did those for the last four days. And Although I did not hear the girls, I heard great reports on what they did and from the young men, they all did a fantastic job. They've led singing at our campfires. They've been in here leading singing, and it's just been a great week to see these young people uh, love the Lord and, and participate in services and do those devotionals. As I said this week, we've been talking a whole lot about God, about His treasure, about our lives, and our lives in relationship to that great gift that God has given us in His Son, Jesus Christ, and how is it that we are to react not only to that, to that sacrifice that He's given us, but then how do our actions go out from camp this week and effectively change the world for righteousness' sake and the cause of Christ? Our first lesson, uh, the first part of the week, was taken from Romans. Turn with me over to Romans, the first chapter. And in that reading, verses 16 and 17 laid the groundwork for where we were going. This is Paul writing this letter, and it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Our first topic that we talked about this week is this immense power that is in God. His awesome power. His awesome, and it just happened that that night then we went out to the campfire and we looked up and it was just a perfectly clear night. And the vast array of stars that we saw. And we were able to identify and look at that and say, that is how awesome the power of God is. That He hung those stars in the very precise place that they needed to be. And that that power that He has unleashed, that He, God, has unleashed to create this world, this power is available to each and every one of us. His saving grace is available to each and every one of us. God has offered that to us. The cost for us was dying to ourselves. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the cost to God was His only begotten Son in Jesus Christ. That He sent Jesus to die to shed His blood so that we may have the remission of our sins. And that that power in that blood is available freely to us because God loved us that much Amen. that He did that. And then we moved on. We talked about the power, but then we went on and we talked about dead men do tell tales. We choose to die to our sin. We choose to die to the former life that we are leading when we decide that we want that power that God offers us. That no longer am I going to be brought down by the things of this world. And we talked about those in great length. The teens opened up a great deal about struggles and things that we have to face. That they have to face on a daily basis at school and with their friends. But we have to turn ourselves from all of that. 
We have to turn ourselves from the world and we have to harness that power and now we have to start focusing it in the right direction. Dead men do tell tales. I tell tales of my former life. Think about Paul, if you would. Paul writes in, in great specificity about what he did to those Christians before he became a Christian. He sought them out to persecute them. He put them in jail. The ones he killed, he said, I did it justly. Like he was proud of the fact that he killed those Christians. And then on that road to Damascus, that power that we talked about came to Paul and he saw the light. He saw the error of his way and he says, no longer am I that. In fact, later in his writings, he talks about the sins of this world and he said, of these sinners, I am chief. My dead self, my spiritually dead self was the one that was an enemy to the cross. I did everything I could to get rid of it. I did everything I could to hurt those Christians. I didn't need those people in my hair. I wanted to wipe them out. That's my dead man telling the story. But now he says, I stand before you as an example of that power that I am able to stand here in front of you today and say, yeah, but even as wretched as I was, chief amongst sinners, I can now stand justified in God's eyes. Washed of my sins, and an apostle of our Lord. Writing books that we are still reading some 2,000 years later. That we are reading those writings and we can understand his struggles. We can understand that when he was dead, that's what God wants us to do. We die to ourselves. We die to this world. And we start living for him. We put him first. What would Jesus do? It's not just a slogan. We have to keep that in our mind. We have to keep that at the forefront of our thoughts when we start thinking, well, should I do this? Should I do this? What would Jesus do? And if I can compare my actions, if I can compare my words, if I can compare the way I live my life to Jesus Christ, the ultimate perfect example, then I have to, the standard by which I have to look at. Folks, it's just real simple. Dead to self. Dead to the world. But that's when life really begins. That, that is when we have true freedom. I've told the teens, I think we talked about it last night. As a Christian, there's no greater feeling than being able to put your head down on the pillow at night and know, not guess, not hope, know that if tonight is the night that I breathe my last breath, I get to go to heaven. Yeah. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what the world doesn't get. Which then leads us to the next point. We can't keep it to myself. I got to get out on the road and I got to tell people about what's in me. I've got to be in one. What, what if, here's the question, what if you were the only Christian left on the planet? Seven billion people out there and you are the only Christian in that seven billion when Christianity died. Or would it thrive? Would you be out telling people about God? Would you be out telling people about Jesus? Because that's exactly what Paul did. He just got done saying, I'm the most wretched amongst the wretched. Chief amongst the sinners. Here I am. And then what does he do? He goes out and he proclaims the gospel that he was trying to shut down. And he, at great peril to himself, doesn't hold back. That's why he's able to write those words. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not telling everybody and anybody that will listen. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm going to be from the mountaintops. You're not going to shut me up. Philippians 1, he talks about here's the best deal of this whole thing. For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. Paul has set himself up in a win-win. 
If I live, I'm going to talk about Christ. I'm going to bring others to Christ. I'm going to tell others that there is a God that loves them, sent His Son to save them, and wants them to live for eternity. I'm going to do that every waking breath that I can. But if I die, I get to go to heaven. That's what God has promised me. And He's promised it to all of us. You want a win-win situation in your life? This is the chance to do it. You put God on, you put Christ on, and you're in that now. It doesn't make it easy. You don't just get your card stamped and say, okay, you're a Christian now, life's going to be a breeze. What happened to Paul once he started preaching? He got whooped. He got beat. He got stoned. He was left for dead in the country. People that he knew turned their backs on him. He was whipped. He was tortured in every kind of way that they could back then. To try to shut him up. But he didn't. And he kept going. That's our job. There's going to be hills when Jesus tells us it to his disciples... These are the very people that saw him raise people from the dead. These are the very people that ate breakfast with him, ate lunch with him, ate dinner with him, walked through there, saw him raise people, saw him heal people, saw him walk on water. These are the people, and he tells them, let me tell you something, guys. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Jesus said, you're going to have problems. It ain't going to be an, an, an easy road. Those of us older enough to remember, what was it, Lynn Anderson? I never promised you a rose garden. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be something else. But, the second half, John 16, 33, says, but be of good cheer. Because I've overcome the world. See, our world isn't here. This is beautiful to look out here. We talked about that the other day. About this being God's handiwork to be able to show us that He exists. That He created this for us to know that He is God. This, but all this stuff's going to be gone. It's just be good cheer because there's an eternity waiting for you. Amen. For the little span of time that you're on this earth, you're going to have troubles. Who amongst us has it? There's people in this, in this room that have been Christians longer than I. And they'll be the first to tell you, yeah, you still have troubles. So young people, you put on Christ. That's when Satan says, uh-oh, I done lost another one on my team. I got to try to get them back. God's up there saying, yeah, but I'm with you. And I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to let you face things. And no matter what you face, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get out of it. A way to get out of it. There's not going to be anything put on you that you can't handle. God says, I promise you that. No one else in the world outside of Christ has that assurance. And then tonight... We go to this. We've been listening to the song all week, Yo-Ho, Yo-Ho, A Pirate's Life for Me. I think it's in their minds. Kind of like it's a small world after all. But it's not a pirate's life for me anymore, regardless when they go home and tell you Mr. Bryan said it was okay to steal tires. They're going to take that out of context when they do. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, if you got a question, call me. But it's a Christian's life for me. That's when it starts. When life, and life more abundantly, as the Bible tells us, that's when it starts. That is when we have that peace. That's when we start our learning process to God. I've talked to many young people over the years and they say, oh, I'll be baptized when I know enough to know it. That day is never going to get here. I'm not standing here professing that I know even an iota about what this book says. 
I study it. I read it daily. I understand God's concepts. But to tell you that I would know everything in this book would just be an outright lie. And anybody else on this planet that would tell you that, it's not true. So that's where we have to strive to learn more. We have to study. We have to get into the book. we got to find out what God wants. Don't look at it just as a book. People say, oh, it's just a boring old book and it's just old stories. There's stories of intrigue in here. There's mysteries in here. There's wars in here. There's love stories in here. But ultimately, this entire neatly wrapped book is a love letter from God to Brian. And I want to know how much he loves me. And it tells me right there. He loves me so much that they wrote John 3.16. But now I've got to live the life. Turn over to Acts, the 26th chapter, and start in verse number number 9. So here's where he gets done to me. Acts 26, starting in verse number 9, says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, this I also do in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I have shut up in prison. This is Paul writing, having received authority from the chief priests, and when I will put them to death, I cast my vote against them. I'm Death, go for it. But now, while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus, in the form of the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen on the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? So I said, who, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. But arise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. There's a moment in our lives, those of us that are Christians, when those words hit right there. When God Himself says, Hey! Wake up! I want you to be a minister of mine. I want you to live for me. That's what I want. That's what God's purpose is. For us to go out and do His will. All things work together for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. His purpose is to spread the good news. To look at the Bible and go out and tell our friends, family, and relatives, neighbors, anybody that will listen about it. But he goes on. But arise and stand for you on your feet. I have appeared for you for this purpose to make you a minister and witness both of the things which I have seen and the things which I'll reveal to you. If you stand up here right now and say, I want to be a Christian, but I don't know everything, God says, here's the book. I'll reveal it to you. Everything you're going to know for godliness and righteousness is neatly tucked away in 66 books. Start studying. And I will reveal these things to you. It's all right here. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. I will have you open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's our mission. Becoming a Christian and then studying. Having God reveal Himself to us and then we go out 
and we tell those people in the world, I want you to turn from darkness, and I want you to turn to light. I want you to turn from Satan, I want you to turn to God. I want you to turn from no hope to nothing but hope. I want you to turn from what's wrong and go for what's right. That's the gospel message. And that He sent Jesus Christ to shed His blood for each of us to do just that. He revealed it quite simply. People talk about the plan of salvation being so difficult. It's not. God wouldn't make it that way. First, we're going to hear the Word. Folks, young people especially, you've heard the Word this week. No doubt in my mind. We've had wonderful teachers. I thank all of you for taking the time to prepare lessons and, and work with the kids. You've heard the, the Word of God. Believe. I want you to believe. Not only believe in the Word, but believe also that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Confess His name before men. I'll say it. I've said it before. I know our youth group probably is already tired of hearing it, but I just think this is just so awesome. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, when he said, He who confesses, Jesus speaking, He who confesses me before men, will I confess my name before my Father in heaven. Can you only imagine that time that I stood up, Brian, in front of a crowd at the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee, and said, Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And at that very moment, he looked at God and he said, That's Brian. He's one of ours. He's on our side. We know Him. That's how awesome this God is. And Jesus is standing up there and He knows my name. I repent. That's that whole turning away from Satan, turning to God, turning away from evil, turning to good. We, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to stumble. We're going to mess up. We're going to mess up big time. Caleb, you had a great message this morning when you talked about how many of us today have, have messed up Christians in the audience. How many of you messed up this last year? And every hand went up. Christians, how many of you messed up in the last month? Every hand went up. Christians, how many of you messed up in the last week? Every hand went up. Christians, how many times have you messed up today? And your hand went up. I'm not perfect. But I strive every day to be perfect. I strive every day to be like God wants me to be. And then that final act is to have those sins washed away. See, we can't stand in front of God with sin. Where evil is, God cannot be there. Where darkness is, when light shows up, the darkness disappears. That's exactly what we're talking about. When you are washed away of your sins, then you are able to stand justified in God's eyes, free from sin, and then, know that He is with us. And lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. We're going to mess up. We all do. But when we confess our faults, when we strive to be better, when we pray about those things, God is faithful to forgive us. And He does every time. So tonight, this message is yours. This week at camp is yours. We've talked to many of you. Every one of you has been in wonderful classes, as I've said. You've thought about things. You've talked about things. And now it's decision time. Jay's going to lead us in a song here in just a second. And if you're not familiar with this, it's just an opportunity to come at this point, come down here and confess whatever it is that you want to talk about. If you have a need to be baptized, this is the opportunity to do it. If you have sin that you want to get rid of and you just want to ask for forgiveness and have people pray with you, this is the opportunity to do it. Do not let the sun go down on another opportunity. We had one baptism last night. Where's, where's he at? Where's the, our newest brother in Christ right there. His dad drove up. 
and we filled up a horse trough and baptized him in a horse. You saw it on the video. That's open to everybody. So if you have any need, why don't you come as together we stand in that position.